45 seconds, a reminder, please chat out what is the difference between the definition and the significance? Awesome, share those responses in the Zoom chat if you haven't had the chance to submit, even if you're not done. So the big thing is the definition is literally just like, what is it? What's happening in that moment? And the significance is the long-term impact of that event. So the Mexican-American War, the long-term impact is this increased sectional tension. Um, as a reminder, there are two ways to submit it. You can either submit it digitally on a Google Doc with the assignment or on paper. If you come in person and you usually show me photos of it on paper, please submit those photos. Anyways, for example, I had a student in AP Gov that showed me those, uh, showed me the photos of her work, but I forgot that I had seen them and did not put in the correct grade on her homework assignment. So again, I'm still asking that you submit photos, even if, even if you've showed me in person. So that way, when I put in the grades, you don't have to worry about me um, accidentally putting in the wrong grade for you. Also, it, your assignment is no longer going to be split in half. There is no longer going to be a part one or a part two. Now it's just gonna be one large assignment that is going to be due one day a week. So for example, this week's Chapter 13 is due on Thursday at 8 p.m. So I can put in the grades Friday morning. Any questions about the homework? It doesn't look like we have any questions, so. We'll go ahead and move forward. So today we are going to be doing a lecture on the road to the Civil War. Um, if you're using the note template, this is already put in for you. If you are writing the notes um, on paper, make sure you have this at the head of your lecture. And we're going to be looking at the road to the Civil War from 1848 to 1860. As we discussed in the do now, the road to the Civil War is a long time coming but we are going to focus on these dates in particular. So I'll give us 30 seconds if you're handwriting your notes to finish getting that set up. Okay, we should be good to go. We're gonna start with the Northern abolitionists and the different types of abolitionism that we uh, see in the way on the road to the Civil War. The first is gradual abolitionism. A gradual abolitionists, abolitionist believes that slavery is fine but we need to limit it, which means we're going to allow slavery wherever it already exists. So again, we are limiting its expansion but we are okay with it lasting wherever it already is. On the other side, 
we have immediate abolitionists who believe that slavery is morally wrong. So they are absolutely against the institution of slavery. And immediate abolitionists believe that slaveholders have used the constitution to fit their own needs. So again, they believe that slaveholders have changed, have used the constitution to fit their own needs. So those are the two versions of abolitionism that we see during this time period. We're now going to look in at the policies that abolitionists are involved in. The most consequential is the Compromise of 1850. So in the Compromise of 1850, the Compromise of 1850 was proposed by uh, Senator Henry Clay. Henry Clay comes back again. I told you guys, he wants to be president so bad, but it just never works out for him. And the Compromise of 1850 proposed by Henry Clay is an attempt of um, placating both the North and the South to try to dissolve the slavery debate. So again, the compromise of 1850, the goal was to placate the North and the South. And placate in this instance is just like, you guys calm down. It's gonna be fine. Let's stop arguing about the slavery thing. And the compromise of 1850 had four pieces, four pieces to the compromise of 1850. The first, California will be admitted as a slave, as a free state. California will be admitted as a free state. Second, New Mexico and Utah will practice popular sovereignty. I'll explain what that is in a second. So New Mexico and Utah will practice popular sovereignty. Sovereignty is spelled at the top of the slide. And what popular sovereignty is, popular sovereignty is they will vote on whether or not they'll allow slavery. So that means that New Mexico and Utah are voting on whether or not they should allow slavery. But you need to know the term popular sovereignty. The third term is the slave trade ends in Washington, DC. So again, the slave trade ends in Washington, DC. And finally, the last one is the Fugitive Slave Law. 
in the Fugitive Slave Law orders, so commands, that United States citizens return enslaved people who had escaped. So again, the Fugitive Slave Law commands that United States citizens return enslaved people who had escaped to the North. Now I want everybody to either highlight or put a star next to the Fugitive Slave Act. Because the Fugitive Slave Act is the most divisive piece of the Compromise of 1850. It is the most divisive and we're gonna zoom in on it next. In the Fugitive Slave Law, there's a piece on the next uh, page for notes for that. So many argued that the Fugitive Slave Law was a fair trade for California being a free state and the uh, slave trade being abolished in DC. But the Fugitive Slave Law starts the nation's path to war. So again, it starts the nation's path to war. Because what this means, the federal government now defends slaveholders' rights. So now federal law defends slaveholders' rights. People in the North actively detest this war. I mean, this, um, this law. So people in the North refuse to follow this law. And ironically, the North proposes that they secede from the South because of them making them practice this law. Because of this law, abolitionists had to find new ways of protecting enslaved people and helping them escape. One of the most popular or well-known is the Underground Railroad, which was a group of um, pathways from the South to Canada. So again, the Underground Railroad is a series of pathways from the South to Canada. It was led by abolitionist Harriet Tubman and they helped over 100,000 enslaved people escape. So again, they helped over 100,000 enslaved people escape. As a reminder, the goal of the Compromise of 1850 was to alleviate or lessen tension between the North and the South, but in reality, it just increased it. So again, the Compromise of 1850, the goal was to alleviate this tension between the North and South, North and South but in reality, it's just increasing it.
This also leads to the creation of new political parties in the 1840s and 1850s. The first to be established is the Free Soil Party. The Free Soil Party was established after the Mexican Cession Territory. So again, the Free Soil Party was established after the conflict of the Mexican Cession Territory. And the Free Soil Party believed that this new territory should be for whites only. Another political party established are the Know Nothings. The Know Nothings were formed in the 1850s. And they were known for practicing nativism. Nativism is spelt N-A-T-I-V-I-S-M. And nativism is anti-immigrant feelings. So again, nativism is anti-immigrant. And they had some common uh, beliefs with the abolitionists. And they believed it was unfair for African Americans to be enslaved while white immigrants are given opportunities. So again, they believe it's unfair for African Americans to be denied rights while white immigrants are given opportunities. This brings us to our next compromise, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In 1854, so 1854, Senator Stephen Douglas got the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act approved. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act declared that the territories of Kansas and Nebraska could practice popular sovereignty and vote on whether or not they would allow slavery. So again, Kansas and Nebraska could practice popular sovereignty and vote on whether or not they would allow slavery. Okay. 
The North thought this was unfair. Again, the North thought that this was unfair because these territories were above the Missouri Compromise Line. So again, the Northerners believe this was unfair because these territories are above the Missouri Compromise Line. Which leads us to one of the bloodiest moments in American history, bleeding Kansas. The stirring conflict between Northern abolitionists and Southern slaveholders comes to a head here. During Bleeding Kansas, a group of radical abolitionists invade Kansas and begin to murder slaveholders and their families in an effort to emancipate their slaves. I have feelings. Usually. So again, radical abolitionists come into Kansas and they murder slaveholders and their families in an effort to emancipate their slaves. which was led by a man named John Brown, who will come up later. He's one of my favorite people in history. He's really interesting. He's weird. He's great. Um, so again, this conflict, uh, this leads to a lot of conflict between slaveholders and Northern abolitionists. And now we're going to look at politics. As we know, neither the Democrats nor the Whigs practice abolitionism in their political party. So neither the Whigs or the, or the Democrats push for abolitionism within their political party. So abolitionists decide we're going to make our own. In 1854, the Republican Party is formed. So 1854, the Republican Party is formed. And the Republicans are comprised of three main groups. These groups um, are usually former Whigs. So again, former Whigs, free soilers, and anti-slavery Democrats. And the first time the Republicans run for pre have a uh, candidate run for president is in 1856, and you can see in the photo and, and you can see on the slide that the Republicans mostly got votes from the North in those northern states. <laughs> so mostly northern states, and while. The Republicans did not win the 1856 uh, election. This shows that they are not a normal third party and that they have a lot of traction going, which we know is true. 
So again, the election of 1856 just shows that the Republican Party is a very notable party that is going to uh, be around for a while. Sorry, I just had to skip through a couple slides. Now we're going to look at the violence from bleeding Kansas in the Senate. <laughs> so whenever people say that things are uncivil in Congress now, they don't know their history. In 1856, Senator Charles Sumner gave a speech criticizing Democrats and slaveholders. So again, Charles Sumner gave a speech criticizing Democrats for their position on slavery. And some did not take kindly to this. Preston Brooks, a representative from South Carolina, got up, grabbed his cane, and beat Charles Sumner over the head with it, nearly killing him. So again, if people say that things are uncivil in Congress now, you can say, but what about 1856? And this moment begins to epitomize this conflict in the South. I mean, in American politics in general, you have these pro-abolition um, Northerners against these pro-slavery Southerners. Sumner becomes a martyr in the North. So again, a martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R. -R. So Sumner's a martyr in the North and Brooks is a hero in the South. In fact, Southerners sent him canes by the hundreds as an endorsement of his actions. <laughs> Petty. Okay, guys, got to move up a little quicker for the last five minutes. Okay. So the power of the pen. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oops. So again, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, which is a book about an enslaved man who is brutalized by his um, slaveholder. And this book becomes a national bestseller. And at this time becomes the second most popular book in the United States. The most popular is the Bible. So again, this book becomes insanely popular and what this book does is it opens up American eyes to the reality of slavery. So it opens up Northern eyes to the reality of slavery when they had previously been able to remain ignorant. And we're going to skip the impending uh, crisis of the South and move on to Dred Scott. In 1857, the Supreme Court heard the Dred Scott case.
Dred Scott was an enslaved man who had been moved from Missouri, a slave state, to Wisconsin, a free state. So he had been moved from Missouri, a slave state, to Wisconsin, a free slave, free state. And so he goes to the Supreme Court and argues that because he had been transported to a free territory, he was now a free man. So again, he argues that because he had been moved to a free state, he was now a freed man. But the Supreme Court ultimately declared he was still enslaved. So again, the Supreme Court declares that he's enslaved. And what this does is it removes the barrier between free and enslaved territory. Now that the Supreme Court has declared that somebody can bring enslaved people into the North, this now means that there is no longer a barrier between the free, between the free territory and the enslaved territory. I'll say that one more time. So again, Dred Scott means, this, uh, this Supreme Court case means there is no longer a divide between free and enslaved territory And we are going to pause there and I will uh, figure out when we're gonna finish our lecture notes. There are still about three more slides left. So again, I will figure out when we are going to do that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. As a reminder, please make sure even if you are not submit, uh, done with your exit ticket that you still submit whatever you have. Also make sure you submit photos of your lecture notes. Those are 50% of your grade. So lecture notes are 50%, exit ticket is the other 50. And just for a piece of clarity on the exit ticket, for part A, you are choosing the most important. And for part B, you are going to make the argument for why one of the other options is not as important as the one that you had originally chosen. So please chat me if you have any questions, but go ahead and transition to the exit ticket. Obviously you'll need to focus on the first four. Again, for part A, you're choosing the most important of those four. And then for part B, you're telling me why one of the other options is not as good. Please chat me if you have any questions. There's no way. 
And just for clarity, there is no right answer. It's whatever you think and you have the best evidence to back up. So there is no right answer. Just whatever you can argue for the best. Awesome, thank you, Shaquem, you may go. Thank you, Jalasia, you may go. Also, I wrote the same thing for part A. Awesome, Kayla, you may go. You guys have about five more minutes to finish up. Mahmoud, you may go. Awesome, you guys have about four more minutes. Awesome job, uh, Giovanni and Leah, you may go. Great responses. Um, Eddie, Alonzo, Samaj, Dwayne, do um, any of you guys need help or are you guys just finishing up? Um, Eddie, Samaj, and Dwayne, make sure you guys just focus on part A, okay? Only worry about what started. And again, for part A, you just need to tell me why does it lead to the Civil War? Did you get mine? Great, Dwayne, you may go. Make sure, and uh, Samaj, make sure you just use your notes. Everything that you need is in your notes.
Awesome, Eddie, thank you. Great job, Samaj, that's exactly right. You guys are free to go, have a good rest of your day. Reach out if you need anything, okay? Bye, Samaj.